Okay, I want to talk about um, buying what you can afford. Um, today is quite a good day for us because we've got our last windows in, uh, in our property in the Philippines. It's quite a large building um, and I think the buildings upstairs probably cost about one and a half thousand pounds altogether. Uh, but there's three apartments underneath that as well. So you can see there's a few, few pounds being spent. But we only buy what we can afford. And in this case, we have some online incomes. We have some money coming into the Philippines. That's paid for the windows over the last year and a half. Now, a lot of people go, a year and a half for fitting windows. Why would anybody? Because we're not in a rush. The It had some windows already there, the old glass blade slotted ones. So they just needed replacing with new ones um, because this will eventually become, the, the top floor will eventually become our uh, Philippines apartment, three bedroom apartment. And then underneath there'll be three apartments for rent plus the other apartments on the other side will go for rent as well once we move our stuff across. So the point is we do stuff in stages and the reason we have a bit of a better uh, disposable income scenario than most people is A, I have no credit cards, B, I have no mortgage, C, I have no car debt, I, I haven't got any debt at all, zero. Um, and this is why, because the car in Spain at the moment is an old Vauxhall Astra uh, that cost me about 500 pounds. Um, I think, sorry, 600, about 600 pounds, I think, including that, because I had to pay the tax as well. So that's it, that was in the price. But the, the point being is we don't have debt. Um, Philippines, it took a while, but we haven't had to worry about paying a bill because we just pay it when we've got the cash. What's happened now, windows are in, so it actually becomes easier for us to finish the building. We've got an architect designing the interior. Um, they'll come back with a price and I'll go, okay, thanks very much, pay him. Then I'll start breaking down the internals of the building into specific prices. Because for example, if I go this month and I've got uh, 20,000 pesos spare, and the floor is gonna cost 14,000, um, plus a bit extra for uh, leveling, you know, any miscellaneous costs, I'd buy that. Then next month I might have less money, but there could be a partition wall for 6,000. So I'll go, okay, do the partition wall this month. And you just do it like that, because we're not in a rush. But the main thing here is we have no debt with it. But the reason the windows had to go in first is to reduce risk of um, water damage from rainfall and whatever um, so now that's finished we can concentrate on the not cheaper overall but it's cheaper to do um, because minimum cost of a window is about 5,000 pesos um, which isn't big money that's only about 80 pounds but the fact is I could get a kitchen unit or something for the same sort of money you know it, internally it's, it can be done at a cheaper, it's more manageable. That's the easiest way of putting it. But this fits into everything. Even our business before, when we had the peso peso machines, we bought the first one. The first one was about 5,000 pesos. Um, I opened it up and seen how it was built. So I built the next one and then got those two. Uh, so the important bit here, the first one, the money from that paid for the materials for the second one. And then we built that one and we got the two of those to build the next two and then you end up with the five and the reason i do it that way um is you end up with no excess because it's like when you open a well like say our um internet cap when we first opened it i think i bought 10 computers to start with and what we did is they were busy all the time extra people come in got the profit from the first head or another one the week after, and then another one the week after. And you build it up till you've got like 16 machines. Um, and then you'll start seeing that the last machine isn't so busy. We haven't wasted any money. Now, I know some people say, oh yeah, but if you had 20 machines, then you would have uh, got the money from um, 
the people that couldn't use the, the machine at the time. No, the profit margin is so minimal, it's just not worth that. Having 10 machines is enough. Having the 16 and them all being busy is fine. But also in the Philippines, things go in fads. You've got a latest internet cafe there. Then two weeks later, another one will open um, a street away and people move over to that one. 60 machines is enough. That's why some of them you'll see only have five or 10 machines, which is why the peso peso machines eventually uh, ended up sat outside because there was more profit in shoving them outside and turning the internet calf into a rental property that churned money, you know, because obviously rented, there's, there's 6,000 pesos there, then outside, getting money, 250, 250 pesos a day per machine, easy money. But it all comes from small investments because the Philippines is quite a funny place to be because everybody copies your idea. So, like there, we owned our first internet calf. Within a month, there were seven new internet calves in the area. Nearly all of them are shut down now, if not all of them, because they open them in the bizarrest places. Um, they'll be in somebody's garage or something. And the thing is, they open it up, they start there, um, because they're using normally money from overseas, from a relative, because what's happened is, Somebody's walked along, seen your internet calf, and says, oh, look, that's busy, there's money in that. And then they'll go and talk to a relative, the relative will fund them opening an internet calf. And at no point do anybody think that you're just halving the business. So one's viable, and then you split it down into two, you're breaking even, split it down into seven, there's hardly any profit or no profit at all. But... The way we did it, because it was in stages, it was already paid for. Um, but then when you put the peso peso machines out on the, the, the back of the house, it's ticking over. All you're doing is coming up and emptying the money out every day. You haven't even got somebody sat there. But it all comes from doing things in slots. You know, don't invest a lot of money in one idea. The Philippines works best with lots of little ideas. Um, I talked to them about this with a piggery before, because that's maybe a piggery is viable, and because of the way the animal feeds are um, overcharged, the, it's a controlled market by San Miguel. Um, you can never be a hundred percent for the what the prices are going to be over a fattening period or whatever. So it's difficult to know where you stand, but then. The butcher wants about 30-40% um, from what they will sell it at. So you've just really lost a lot of money there. Vet veterinary fees are a rip-off. Um, they'll sell you everything. But the fact is, you don't need everything they're selling you. But if you're not familiar with it, you don't know. Now, where I would recommend having a piggery is a small one for, for your own meat because you can guarantee the meat quality. You can guarantee uh, any excess you can sell locally because you haven't got excess meat, but your neighbors will buy it off you yeah? and they'll pay the same, if, if not a little less than what they'll get it from the market. So your profit margin's there. But you can also make a good profit by the saving on what you would have spent at the supermarket yourself. So that's why I would have a piggery. But, it, well, not me personally, because I'm not a pork eater, I don't eat pork. Um, but it, it's one of the reasons why having a little piggery works. So you can have like five pigs or two. You'll see a lot of people have them for fiestas and birthdays and things like that, where they get one from somewhere and just fab it up with that. That's why they're doing it. Because the fact is that's the cheapest way of doing it, uh, paying for a party, is fattening one up just for it. But if you imagine these little ideas, you've got like your little piggery, you freeze your meat, you cut your meats, you've got self-sufficient meat, meat production. You put a couple of apartments, rent those out, get yourself a little 
Sari Sari store is ticking over. Not making great money, but worst case scenario, it gives you beer for free. Get a couple of pacer pacer machines, that pays your electric bill. Um, the money you get off your rentals will actually be spare money. I call that your grocery money. Um, and maybe there's other bits and pieces you can do. Maybe you pick people up from the airport in your car. Maybe people hire your car. These are the things that can make you sustainable in the Philippines. And it's all about doing things as you can afford them. Because, um, for example, if you go and buy something outright and you don't need it, it's gone. That money's gone. You can't sell it because somebody will... Uh, you buy a multi-cab. Um, buy a multi-cab, use it for a year. If you try and sell it for anywhere near you paid for it, you'll be lucky. I mean, I remember people paying 110, 113 thousand pesos for a multi-cap. I paid 45,000 for mine. I think I sold it for 28,000 uh, a couple of years later. Um, it was in a worse state than I bought it for, let's put it that way. But at the same time, I'd had that money out of it. <laughs> but I bought what I could afford and I bought what I needed. I didn't go for the one with all the aircon and everything else on because as I learned with my uh, 4x4, is trying to find somebody that actually knows how to maintain the aircon. It becomes a problem um, because we've had it regassed four times due to people not knowing what they're doing. Um, so buy what you need, not what you like. And eventually buy what you like because you've already invested in what you needed when you needed it. All right, thanks for watching.